Hi, welcome to Law and Justice. I'm Jane Mulcahy. This is a special series on the topic of Relationships Matter. And today I'm really, really pleased and excited to be joined by Cathy O'Byrne. Hi, Cathy. How are you? Hi, Jane. How are you doing? I'm great. You're well yourself? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Yeah. Happy to be here chatting with you. <laughs> Thank you, Cathy. So uh, to kick off, if you can just tell me a little bit about yourself, please, that would be super. I never I never know how to answer <laughs> this one. <laughs> so I am the eldest of four um, children um, born into a working class family um, in 1977. My mom was is from Belfast and my dad is from Clare. Um, was the first in my family to go on to third level education, which as a teenager, mm-hmm. like I really didn't get the significance at the time. I remember thinking, what's the big deal? Like, why mm-hmm. are you all going on about this? So I went and I trained as a teacher um, in Mary I. Um, I did my B.Ed. there in 95, um, came out. I was 17, actually going into college, which a baby which was crazy when I think about it now. And um, I can remember being on a teaching practice in a prefab with 36 six-year-olds and thinking, I wonder, am I even insured? Is <laughs> that kind of way? I was young myself, do you know that kind oh. of way? Um, but it was a kind of a baptism of fire. So I was about 20 then when I came out and started working as a teacher. And I loved it. I had always loved working with children. Um, and being with them and was always interested in children and their development and yeah just curious um I suppose so I loved teaching I taught in a lot of different settings a lot of different types of schools um rural urban um well resourced not so well resourced single class um multi-class okay um and I worked in special ed uh, settings as well so I was doing a lot of extra kind of trainings and CPD and all the time trying to keep my skill level and my knowledge level up with mm-hmm. what I was kind of seeing as a teacher um and was working away happily became a mom um when I was 26 or 7 that was eye opening because I was <laughs> really like used to having 34 35 36 kids in the class and thinking you know sure one at home will be grand like it'll be a piece <laughs> of cake and I was kind of going from school to home school to home and yeah I learned a lot around that time actually about how hard parenting mm-hmm. is you know and I suppose trying to get the balance right of what amount of yourself and your energy you're giving to your work, you know, and learning to keep a, a little bit back for mm-hmm. home, particularly actually when he would have been in junior infants and I was yeah. teaching junior and senior infants at the time. And I was using every ounce of patience and goofiness <laughs> and silliness and come on yeah. energy I had and Jane, I was going home to him and I had nothing left and it wasn't okay. fair. It wasn't yeah. okay. You know, mm-hmm. I, I remember the car park we had at school, you know, you could turn right and I could be home in 15 minutes or I could turn left and listen to something on the radio and it might take 40. And most days I needed to turn left just okay. so that I could even things like doing homework. You know, I, I would have been less patient than I wanted to be with him you know yeah. so I had to have a look at that um, and it was great learning for me and I taught most levels um, and then you know as things progressed I suppose needs got bigger I started to notice you know a lot more anxiety and right. perfectionism actually in particular um, coming into the classroom a lot of kids maybe afraid to take risks or give yeah. things a go unless they could nail them and I suppose I have a bit of that in me myself, you know, and maybe that's why I I recognized it. But I I didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know how to build grit or resilience Mm -hmm. or esteem in that way, because in school, it's very linked to the product and the result as opposed to the process and the struggles and the risks that we take and the the vulnerability, I suppose, that comes with giving something a shot. So I... I I had it in my head for the longest time that I wasn't going to be a teacher forever. And I was particularly struggling with bureaucracy and red tape and planning and paperwork. I felt it was really 
taken away from the energy that I wanted to be able to give, you know, being with the kids and yeah. playing with the kids and working creatively. So I um, started to research what else I might like to do. Um, wasn't quite sure what that was or what that would look like. And I read um, a book called Dibs. Um, have you ever read that? I haven't. No, tell me about it. It was written by Virginia Axline. Um, she was one of the earliest, I suppose, creators of non-directive play therapy. And she would have been very led by Carl Rogers' work and Rogerian person-centered principles, but adapted them for, for being with children. So Dibs was a little man who had, I suppose, some what you might call behavior mm. difficulties. Um, hate using those kind of terms and some real struggles with communication. Um, and it was hard for the grown-ups around him to understand him, his his own parents included, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so she was invited in, I think, as an intern to begin working with him. And she worked in a really non-directive, empowering way. And I suppose he was able to show her through his play and what mm -hmm. he was able to communicate through play, which is is their language anyway. That's the fundamental principle of play therapy. She was able to understand him build relationship with him and there was just the most powerful transformation not just in him but in her I think the book nice kinda, it's lovely you know it's beautiful so when I read it I thought geez that sounds cool <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> mind learning how to to do that and I think I was more drawn to the relational side of teaching anyway you know I'd always know their little bits of news and their yeah. ins and outs and that was always more important to me as a teacher and actually to me as a mother as well you know when I'd go to a parent teacher meeting I really didn't care about stens or you know scores it was just uh -huh. is he is he okay is he happy is he is he hanging out with a few friends yeah. like that I didn't it was interesting actually my whole outlook was different and um, once I became a parent so I found um, through research uh, the Children's Therapy Centre, which is a therapy training centre in the Midlands. So in 2010, I signed up for first a two year postgrad in play therapy and then went on to do a master's in child psychotherapy and adolescent psychotherapy, too. So I was able to integrate a lot of what I was learning in the last few years of my teaching career, I, ca I came out of teaching in 2014. So I, I had kind of four years of training while I was amazing. Still, yeah. And it was, they were my happiest years because BTC children's therapy center, it's highly experiential and it's academic, but it's quite integrated learning. So everything I was learning about regulation um, and relating and the brain and neuroscience, I just was fascinated. So I had like this, live lab you know or I could go oh, in yeah. and try it all out and you know as a parent too and I had brilliant principals they were so supportive of any sort of initiative I'd really? say I want to do this they'd be like give it a go so it was great they were the most fulfilling years actually mm -hmm. um that I would have had in teaching and yeah I definitely felt I did my my best teaching at the end you know when I knew about all this and I wasn't afraid to to try things out and really kind of unlock the power of play and the potential and the creativity that kids have so naturally but I think sometimes it can be suppressed you know by systems and sure. structures so yeah then in 2014 I I went for an interview um in a specialist therapy center um and I still hadn't finished my dissertation actually that didn't get finished until 2015 that was self-directed which uh, doesn't always suit me the best but anyway, I got the job, um, much to my surprise and um, and delight. So I took a career break and my private practice, the Swallows Trail, had been kind of founded in 2012 and was building slowly in mm -hmm. a part time capacity, I suppose, alongside teaching. Wow. So in yeah. So in 2014, I came out of the classroom into specialist uh, therapy center. Um, which was for children who had experienced child sexual abuse or who, wow. or who were um, exhibiting, I suppose, harmful sexual behavior. Um, so that was kind of a part time contracted basis. And then the Swallows Trail continued to grow at the same time. And um, so I, I, I stayed in that work for four years, which was just. I think it's where I learned 
to be a therapist, if yeah. that makes sense. You know, I think there are there are things in life and with any job, you know, that you can't fully prepare for until you're learning on the ground and mm-hmm. learning on the job. So I I really think that that work and the work I got to do with the children and the teens and their families, you know, that's where I became a therapist. Yeah. I really feel that in a strong way and you know always will be so grateful for the learning that that came with that and the challenges and you know all the all the I suppose it can bring up an awful lot for you personally I think and to be working at the forefront of of such trauma and you have to be minding yourself and you have to be knowing yourself and you have to be looking after yourself Mm -hmm. um and so in 2018, I was kind of reflecting. So when you take a career break, it it can be approved for up to five years, but you must apply at the end of every year and it has to be reapproved. And I thought, you know, I came out of teaching to try and grow my private practice and I haven't really been able to give it mm-hmm. my full attention. So I decided um, in 2018 to go back into the Swallows Trail full time and just really immerse myself in it. Um so it was in Shannon at the time it had been in Ennis initially and then it was in Shannon for about seven years so full-time then in private practice uh, self-employed working with kids of all ages stages abilities teens and their families Um, and then the pandemic hit and we had relocated as a family so we had moved from Clare down to the kind of border of Limerick and Cork so it was kind of an hour of a commute up and down that hadn't been part of the story mm-hmm. before that and um, my son was very keen to finish his secondary schooling in Shannon mm-hmm. um, and that was important to him and to me because it was just a brilliant brilliant school and you know when you have your roots uh, yeah. put down so I kind of committed to keep the playroom open for as long as as we needed to be doing the commute but actually you know with the pandemic and the lockdown I think as a therapist I hadn't realized the full extent of what I was carrying and had mm-hmm. carried um, sure. in my own body in my own spirit in my own that's psyche. interesting I, I d- you know you don't know until you slow down and yeah stop. and I suppose what was quite unique about that time is that trauma was collective. We were all experiencing, you know, it's, it's different to be supporting clients with trauma when your own situation is, is relatively okay and stable. I get you. But, but it had a big impact because, you know, I was a long way away from my family and my parents for the first time. Um, and I felt, I felt the draw on me energetically really quite a lot, to be honest with you. Mm Mm-hmm. And I started to look at, again, you know, what I was talking about initially um, when I was talking about teaching, like how much of yourself goes into your work and how much are you holding back for for the yourself. people that. And yeah, 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 yeah. So I not all of my clients could transfer to teletherapy. We had to take a lot of extra training and CPD to, to mm-hmm. learn how to try and translate uh, that and it worked surprisingly well actually relationally with lots of kids and for some it just wasn't going to yeah. work so we ju- I just used to make little videos and send them you know just to keep yeah. the, the connection alive and well so when I went back um, after the second lockdown I really felt I want to continue in this vein. I want to continue, you know, working with families, but I just want to be able to do this a bit differently. Mm -hmm. So I was, my waiting list had been closed for the longest time. I was always full. I could never meet the demand. And that only um, got worse, actually, and busier after lockdown. And I found it really hard because I think for parents to have to make a call in the first place, it's a huge leap. It takes a lot. And then to be told, Ask oh, I'm, help. that's it. And I wouldn't be great at asking for help myself. You know, I'd rather pretend <laughs> I know how to do it all. So <laughs> something um, big started to happen for me. And I thought, you know, I, I don't. And because of the way that therapy slots were you know, working and allocated, it was very difficult to say when, you know, Mm -hmm. more spaces would be free. So I thought, you know what, when I, when I worked with families anyway, I would have spent a lot of time initially working with parents and carers to resource them to help their child and, and maximize all the benefits of therapy. So I was working systemically anyway. 
And I thought, you know what, what if I could offer that for a while, then parents would get a targeted Mm -hmm. kind of immediate response when they need it. And it's started to become and evolve into sort of a holding space for parents and families and their children, while some of them might be waiting for a therapeutic space. So lots of colleagues might refer to me now Mm -hmm. that I've decided to just pivot, I suppose, and diversify into full time online parenting support and to be fair it's it's such it's an area of interest to me it's an area of passion to me because I struggle with it myself do you know I think it's 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 easy to know the theory and to read the books and to you know have your professional hat on but it's a whole other thing to be at home trying to do it um every day so you know it's I've always been drawn to it I've always read about it all my CPD has you know circle of security filial therapy pace I've always kind of gone that way anyway, because I really believe in the power of the relationship. So I suppose where it has brought me to today is that I now work full time um, in supporting parents, either individually or in groups or in workshops or th- maybe through their workplaces and a, li- a little bit more into training work as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the Children's Therapy Centre um, asked me to join their academic staff in oh, 2017, great. Yeah, which was humbling and surprising and terrifying all in equal measure so I I'm involved in the teaching part on the masters and some of their um CPD as well so I have a nice mix of kind of I got to keep some of my teaching work yeah just applied to to therapy and children and work with my parents and yeah I'm getting to focus more on really working with and empowering parents and helping them to understand what might be going on for their children. So I find it very different, um, very energizing and fulfilling. And it's lovely to be part of that, actually, to be helping parents to see their own potential and their own power in it. Because I think you can feel very lost as a parent or a bit helpless or very overwhelming. You know, it can be very frustrating, can be... And lonely. Very lonely is is the word actually because you know I don't think not not everybody and certainly not many people have a safe place where they can go and just say this is just so hard you know I don't know if I'm doing this right you know I you know when you're second guessing yourself so you, we all need people that we can be honest about but it can be lonely then if we don't mm-hmm. yeah it is it's a lonely old road and we all want to do our best and we are doing our best but we just can't help second guessing or rerunning yeah. things or doubting ourselves or you know we can be so easily tripped into guilt around things or shame around things so especially I, women I think to be I fair think, yeah I suppose we're wired aren't we yeah. biologically to look after the the caregiving needs and the kind of looking out for attachment behaviors and we're used to holding quite a complex mental load like that's about anticipating planning um you know Re, rejigging things you know adapting modifying so um I think you know I I'm trying to bring my own humanity and humility to mm-hmm. the work because I am a mental health professional but you wouldn't think it walking around the house here <laughs> some of the days <laughs> yeah well I think it's it's lovely you know and Gabor Mate recently was talking as well about the difference between talking about things and teaching and disseminating information and then practicing it day to day in one's own life, yeah. there can be this gap. And I think that's probably true for any of Everything. us, you know, yeah. I do. I And I think also, though, admitting that is actually quite human and saying, you know, but but it starts with having a bit of the information in the first place, because then you can check yourself and kind of go, oh, I'm not doing my best here or I need to to take yeah. the 40 minute journey home or I need to do my yoga or, or you know, a bit of that's minding so myself in order to. Yeah. To, to be the best that I can be or access supports from the likes of yourself, Cathy. But if we could just pause a second and go back to your actual teacher training, because um, okay. teacher yeah. training is something I'm very interested in, particularly because, as you say, you're in a privileged position. You've all these little smallies or, or children of various ages, stages, capacities, um, relational experiences, uh, just general experiences of the world in front of you. And I'm wondering how much focus 
you received when you were such a young person studying on things like safety, attachment, impact of uh, of trauma and child development in terms of capacity to learn, relational ability and behavior? Did you get much? Very little. Mm-hmm. So nothing at all on safety. Um, there were modules on, we'll say, developmental psychology and educational psychology. So there there would have been um, a sprinkling of kind of attachment theory, mm-hmm. but nothing that was linking it to, so this is what that might look like in a classroom. You know, okay. if you are if you meet a child with an anxious avoidance style or an ambivalent style or just nothing like that. It was just, this is this, is this and that's that. Mm. And no sort of support to, and I, I you know, when you're in a, a degree course, you know, it's chunked, like it's yeah. quite chunky and clunky and there's not a lot of joined up thinking. There was nothing at all on uh, the impact of trauma on child development and all the was around key theorists, you know, Piaget, social learning theory, Bandura, all that type of stuff. But it was all quite pedagogical and yeah. top down. It was like, this is how you go in and teach. Yes. Um, no relational focus whatsoever. In fact, we were told at one point and, and other trainees have verified this. Don't even smile at them before oh Christmas or you're or you're finished. That yeah, was they, the end of that take sentence. Advantage. You know, this whole attitude of don't be giving kids an inch now or they'll take a mile on you. Wow. And I found that so counterintuitive because I would be quite, you know, get yeah. in there and get to know them and have the crack. So I found that like, why why are they advocating for this so like there were newer lecturers that were a bit more progressive and were really getting into the new curriculum and active learning and stuff and that that was interesting but it still wasn't necessarily relational and it still wasn't really about creating you know core conditions of safety and trust in your classroom and with your your children and for me it was very top down you know yeah. this is what you must teach and sure, now we know everything has to work from the yeah. bottom up, you know, and I think that's probably one of the biggest miss. I don't know. It's just a disservice, I think, you know, because everybody is trying really hard. You know, even parents will approach things from the top oh, yeah. down sometimes. You know, let me just tell you, let me explain why, you know, trying to problem solve when that's not where the child is in their brain. And so that gets really frustrating for everybody. Whereas when you know, actually, you just need to flip that and work from the bottom part up from yeah. the brain, because your brain stem needs to know, are you safe? And your yeah. limbic area needs to know, are you loved and cherished? And mm-hmm. then the top part of your brain is able to say, yeah, what can I learn from this? But you actually can't learn when you don't feel safe. You can't learn if your brain is stressed. Mm-hmm. You can't learn if your basic needs are not being met and you're hungry or you're tired or you don't know where you're going to be sleeping that night. So, yeah. you know, I think it's so good that we know all this now and it would be just lovely if it started to become, you know, penetrate and infiltrate thinking around how to work with children, you know. And to me as a as a non-teacher, uh, but as a mother now, it seems to me like the most fundamental information that like mm-hmm. before you even get to curriculum design or what are we going yeah. to teach people, there needs to be the um the kind of strong rebuttal of the presumption that all children are equally positioned to learn. You know, they're not even, they're not. If, you know, whether or not they have a, an intellectual disability or anything else the condition of their state and their nervous system, if it's shook or overwhelmed for whatever reason, Mm. then their capacities are diminished. And I've met people who've gone to prison and later found safety in the classroom there, weirdly, Mm. where they have managed to learn and Mm. and done junior cert and leaving cert exams, having been told that they were they were thick or just, you know, that there was something wrong with them in school. And I think this is even still happening to this day sometimes, hopefully not too often, Mm. but that children are being given messages that they cannot learn for some reason, or they don't want it enough. Um, Yeah, Or if they don't fit box or the late, you know, the grown-ups expectation. Um, 
But that's lovely, actually, that those adults were able to learn and develop once yeah. they experience safety. Doesn't that just show how important it is, you know? Um, and that it can happen anywhere, actually. That you yeah. know, prisons that we might think are terrible, awful places, and they can be, and they can be unsafe. But how strange that people could find the safety there at that point when they couldn't find it in a, a mainstream classroom. Yeah. Something yeah. is wrong. It's or, really interesting, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think then the the training I got would have been quite behaviorist, mm -hmm. you know, catch them being good and really celebrate all that and then have all these rewards and sanctions and all this kind of crack. So when I was training as a therapist, I read Alfie Cohn's work, mm -hmm. um, which is throws all of that on its head. <laughs> Um, and I started to I started to run my classroom totally relationally, no rewards, no star of the week, no massive sanctions. We we did it together. We did it relationally. And I think and there was no anarchy. Well, <laughs> I knew I was going anyway, so I, that sounds terrible. But I, I just like even my approach to play, I valued play. I valued relationship. Right. And I thought, you know, I'm not doing this star of the week crack every week because the kids know it's not real. You know, it's right. demotivating. It's makes a lot of them feel not good enough. You know, yeah. it's it's manipulation of you know rather than seeing their strengths and supporting them to grow so I just I threw it all out the window anyway and I think that's the and they were my happiest years they were my happiest years of of teaching and and I really felt yeah this is possible you know and I think having the background of a teacher can can make it easier to relate to teachers because you know sure. I've been in, I've been there sure. but I think the the challenge we have here is that our class sizes are probably of the highest in Europe okay and so when they're that big and the needs are that big and the needs are only continuing to grow you know people if they don't have something else in their toolbox they will mm. you know by default go into sort of crowd control or more behaviorist mm. strategies which also don't work for children who are wired differently like if children could be doing as well as they can they would be you know and if they could be doing better they would be doing better so I agree that it's fundamental and mm -hmm. um, now I think Mary I have a pilot program where they're starting to bring in kind mm -hmm. of trauma-informed education for their fourth years which is great but I think everybody that's coming out um, now and even you know um to uh, adults who are working in early childhood education sure. like they need to know all of this because sometimes the the expectations people hold for toddlers three-year-olds you know for they're completely not in line with what's developmentally possible or yes. neuro sequentially mm. even possible so you know I would love to see way more education around it um, and once you know how it goes and and the way it works it's much easier then to try and adapt your own responses and your own reactivity and manage your own feelings around it but I think it's fundamental I agree with yeah. you yeah and even having some understanding of our own attachment history maybe and how we might be yeah. prone to responding to people you know um I I, I think that can be benefit even though we might not fully know mm. um but but attachment is not a one-way street obviously yeah. there's there's yes. two people or multiple people in relationships and just even around, I think, hostile attribution bias and stuff is very interesting. Yeah. If a child yeah. is wired to feel unsafe because of their experiences with the adults in their lives, then a teacher's kind of serious expression until Christmas is yeah. going to be going really to be very, very triggering. Yeah. 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 And your nonverbal communication is way more significant than your verbal. And, you know, an awful lot of kids who've had um traumatic experiences and unsafe um experiences and you know experiences where it's made it hard to trust and feel safe with the grown up they're going to be quite hyper vigilant and sensitive to any changes in the environment or the climate and you know their reactions very often make complete sense when you think about them but if you don't know about that um possibility as an adult you're going to go off what you see which is behavior you know and you're missing a whole a whole domain of the child's you know being and functioning that you could be responding to as opposed to coming down hard on a behavior that actually makes sense as yeah. an adaptation a lot of the time um, 
Yeah. Looking back when you were teaching, can you recollect some interactions with children in the classroom that you can now maybe you mightn't have known at the time that the child might have had some attachment difficulties or childhood trauma, but but without, you know, really going into any detail. Yeah. But can yeah. you can you bring your your professional expertise as a psychotherapist and a child and adolescent and family support therapist to what you might have encountered or even behaviors of parents maybe yeah I can and I I sat with this actually for a while um and every incident that came back to me actually came in the same school which okay. would have been pretty disadvantaged pretty traumatized as a community um and real struggle actually for children and parents. And when I when I got in under, you know, the, the specific interactions that came to mind, I think two things just kept coming, um, fear and poverty. Okay. They just kept coming. Um, you know, there was there was some definitely some fight responses mm -hmm. absolutely some flight responses and I wouldn't have understood this at the time but lots of freeze okay. shut down collapse responses and you know I think knowing what I know now about the window of tolerance and trauma and stress responses you know yeah it even some of the behaviors of parents you know that, that would have seemed very angry or defensive, you know, they were probably very frightened of mm -hmm. judgment or, or things like that. And some of the pupils would have, they would have been spiky, you know, they would have been mm -hmm. prickly. They would have had to put on certain armor and masking, you know, to focus, to, to I suppose, to survive and to, to be there. And that would have come off as intimidating Okay. to some of the other pupils and even to me as a young teacher at times but I look at that totally different now and, and what I see was fear you know and what I see was their best attempt to be there and mm -hmm. survive and maybe to keep people at a, distance. at a safe enough distance as well you know um, but some of it was quite heartbreaking some of it was really challenging as a young teacher because I did feel ill-equipped I was like I don't I don't know what to do with this you know and depending on who you spoke to you had some people who were still in it, you know, and in there on a heart level and some people who were, you know, vicariously very traumatized by being there themselves or a little bit burnt out. So, you know what, I'm, it's not always possible to get the learning you need or the the support you need, maybe. Um, but I did I did my best with it. But I look back on it now and I was like, geez, I wish I'd known all this stuff now, you know, yes. that I that I didn't know then. And like the behavior, you know, the group of the week, all that, that was never going to motivate or work or help, you know, though they didn't need that, you know, they were much lower down on yes. the Maslow's hierarchy, you know, and I needed to be showing them that I was a safe adult and a predictable adult. And do you know, it was, it was interesting though, because over the 16 years of teaching that I reflected on, most of the examples came from probably what would have been the most disadvantaged um, setting. Yeah, that's super interesting because, of yeah. course, trauma and attachment issues do also happen in more privileged backgrounds, but people yeah. could maybe hold it together a bit better or they yeah. can access mental health supports. You know, mm -hmm. domestic violence does happen in middle class families. Uh, it happens too. everywhere. Yeah. Or yeah. addiction happens in middle class everywhere. families yeah. too. But I, I think your point about the fear and poverty, like it appears from a lot of the studies I've read or, or ACE studies that they cluster more, mm -hmm. the, the, the accumulation of more and more adversity in poor areas. Mm -hmm. And then it tends to be more and not only intergenerational, but also there's more of it from household to household Absolutely. in the communities. Yeah. So the communities are chronically stressed and might mm -hmm. be open drug market. It's like oh, you spoke at um an, an event for me before on our mm -hmm. Greentown program and uh, in the White Town community where there's a lot of poverty and drug dealing and intergenerational um, trauma as well. There seems to be a bit of 
shut down almost at the community level um, and the individual level. So this this is slightly um, jumping around a bit, but in relation to say being open to things like art or creativity or being able to say be in a classroom and do drama or things like this, do you also have to feel a bit safe to do that? You know, you do, do you- yeah. Yeah, yeah. And why and is I, that, Cathy? So even if you look at the basic attachment loop, if you like, that mm-hmm. circle of security, you have to set off from a safe place mm-hmm. and that, that will support your exploration. And you also have to be able to come back into a safe haven to have your attachment needs met. Um, I suppose I've noticed over the years that the more severe the trauma that the young person had experienced, the, the longer that it took and that they needed to feel safe to be able to explore. So, you know, I can remember young people not moving out of one particular corner of a playroom for six, eight weeks. And the only part of them that was moving was their eyes, wow. just, just constantly scanning the environment, but needing that time mm-hmm. to figure out that. I was a safe grown up, you know, I did care. I was willing to go at their pace. But, you know, to come back to the school context, drama and creativity and anything that requires you to let go of your inhibitions for a time, Mm -hmm. you know, does require you to drop your guard. And if you're if you're in quite a hyper vigilant state, that's hard, hard to do. Um, Now, I, I don't know. So because drama is embodied, I would have done a lot of drama, actually, and it it was great. But you needed to be willing to do it with them. You know, I think just get get in there with yourself because art is more sensory and your hands are going into things. That's all automatically kind of tactile and regulating. Okay. so so the more sensory elements of art, you know, clay, paint, Mm -hmm. finger paint and fabric natural stuff you know I found I found they did engage quite well with that okay. once I I I always felt it needed to be open-ended and invitational do you know I I don't like I the way art has to be 30 replications of the same thing in some yeah. set. that's not art that's yeah. not art at all so I, I suppose I would be personally very interested in art and I you know the way I worked actually was if you feel like doing this with clay you get the clay you know if I give you that freedom you take the responsibility to tidy up after yourself oh, wow I'm yeah excellent. now I might well that was towards the end now the, yeah. the last principal I had came in and he said you're you're mad and I said yeah, no, yeah. come back and come back in a half an hour and it'll all be back to normal but I I did feel like certain media work better for me so I was like wow I'm learning this about myself I'm going to give this to the opportunity to the kids as well but I did find once there was a sensory element that I didn't know at the time yeah. why it worked but it would have been regulating the brain stem and it would have been creating that but you know it's I remember running groups you know as a trainee and um, they were with uh, teenagers from the traveling community yeah. kind of an after school thing I did a voluntary um and I did a lot of cooking and you know nurturing and we we made a lot of food and we ate it together mm. and then one week I decided to do drama and they they absolutely went bananas they like, loved it no no off the wall oh, really <laughs> no way no oh, way really okay I, I got ahead of myself Okay. I, I needed to stay in the sensory. It was too threatened. They didn't feel safe enough to, you know, to be Very try on a role. Yeah, but I thought this be great now. And, you know, it was great learning for me because yeah. we were getting on. We were getting on fabulously. We were cooking. We were eating. It was lovely now. And I think maybe four or five weeks in, I changed it up. Um, And it did not. It didn't go down well. And that was go- great learning for me. I was like, OK, that was too much too soon. So I think you have to put in. The fundamental work and the basic work to to regulate the nervous system and then maybe try and work up. But yeah, I found drama. You just needed to do the work. Art, I thought once it had a sensory component, it it offered some bit of regulation. But, you know, it's it's if you were to say we're going to draw this or or create that, you know, that could be threatening and they might feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think it is anyway. It should be more much more free, you know, and much more, you know, unique to the individual. Yeah. 
Thanks, Cathy. I'm just very interested in in the arts in relation to our current project, the Greentown Project and pro-social mm -hmm. opportunities, but I've noticed that it's difficult to kind of that that people have seemed not ready, you know, yeah, um, yeah. just not ready. So it could be that, linked to safety and and vigilance, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And it's um, just such a wonderful tool to like writing a song, a rap, a poem. Oh, my, yes. you know, it's got endless potential, you know, once they're in a receptive state, I suppose, or that's it. in an open in an open state. Yeah. Um, and actually, just even on the, the drama, I know that uh, Bessel van der Kolk says it can be really good for trauma processing yeah. even yeah. and working in safely in groups. And also a, a, a man I met recently in Scotland was saying he did his first um, qualification in drama and it allowed him to try on emotions that he couldn't feel for himself mm. in relation to his own life, you know, that yeah. he was able to yeah. feel them in the context of whatever the play was, which I thought was interesting as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, powerful therapeutic tool. Yeah. In the right hand. At absolutely. the right time as well. At the I right guess. time and in the right hands. Yeah. yeah. Right. And with trust, I think trust of where the client is at here, yeah, the person is at and where you're, where you're at yourself as well. For sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of the social determinants of health um, and movements like Black Lives Matter, Cathy, now I know Ireland is still kind of a pretty homogenous society where we're still mainly uh, white Irish people, but it has become a lot more diverse over the last mm -hmm. 20 years. Do you think things like colonialism, uh, racism and cultural violence are you know, are matters that you you deal with in a therapeutic setting or are you supporting parents with any of these type of things when they come to you for advice? So probably not at the moment in the parenting work, although there would be, you know, some parents who've, um, who've needed to access support you know, through relocating to another country and would have experienced lots of ad adversity. That'd be kind of personal and unique to them. In the therapeutic work, it was relevant in the sense that um, I had worked quite a bit with mums who were living in direct provision. Okay. Um, and I found that really, really, really hard. Mm -hmm. You know, just in terms of how they were living and how they were having to live and the needs that they had, the needs that their children had, you know, and living in a, <clears throat> living in a community or a center where you would have a highly traumatized population, you know, and who would have felt quite unsafe mm -hmm. at the time and, and all the things that can, you know, go off and happen then dynamically. And I suppose having to look at what, what was possible then therapeutically for families living in those conditions you know very often it might have had to have been more resourcing work or more skills around responding um but just yeah that was quite humbling actually just to to see the and upsetting you know sure. to see that you know a mum might have something like I think it might have been 17 euro or 23 euro or something I just, and even you know, your food is a big part of your story and your culture yeah. and you've been able to cook the food that is nourishing and nurturing to you and then maybe having to eat food that's not going to agree with your digestive system at a time when maybe it's not fitting with your body's rhythm. You know, I just, sure. it was really, that was a, a whole other level at having to look at, you know, support systems and secondary client needs and, you know, really trying to be with parents in the way that I could. Yeah. Um, but I just I just really struggled with that, actually, as a just as a human rights issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does sure. that make sense? Yeah, it but does. The, I, food, I the food used to really bother me to know that it was totally alien. It was, you know, the wrong time of the day. It was upsetting their tummy. You know, it was just yeah. not... You talk a very about trauma informed system, that's it. you know, yeah, that you have no it. choice and yeah. voice, yeah. no power. And, yeah. and, and just to clarify, would these um, 
parents and young people have have been accessing the service for uh, sexual violence, is it? Yes, they would. Okay. Have. Yeah, they would. So, have. so yeah. they the the children experienced a profound, a uh, profoundly traumatic and sometimes trauma. Yeah. And and then were maybe living in conditions where there were adult men, you know, yep. living there yep. as well. So not a safe yeah. environment necessarily no, for them. No. And even like there was there was, you know, situations where maybe multiple children and a parent would be living in one hotel room. You know, how do yeah. you even get space to decompress? or get your head straight, or if something goes off dynamically, you know, because the attachment again would be relevant here. Yeah. Like, where do you go to get a bit of respite from that? Or, you know, it's how do you support your child who's been traumatized when you might have a very similar history sure. yourself and lots of intergenerational things are, are coming out. So yeah, it would have been more relevant in the direct ther therapy work, which would have been partly around systemically mm -hmm. supporting parents as well, just to even assess readiness mm -hmm. for therapy or free therapy yeah. considerations, or even if it was the right thing to do, you know, whether, and very often it was the best thing to do was work with the parent for a longer time and maybe do some bits of resourcing work but yeah in the in the work now maybe not as much mm. um but you know um any parent can can ring up and look for it or you know sure. seek it or, or sometimes it might happen actually through a family resource center you know i might go in and do sensory play um and supporting parents to play with their kids and build connection, you know, so it can happen lots of ways, mm -hmm. but it's probably more relevant to the direct therapy work, I would think. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Kathy. And could you maybe say something about um, therapy readiness and what can get in the way? For example, in in um, in the Greentown project, in one of our trial sites, it has appeared, uh, at least in the first phase of implementation, that if you're in the middle of overwhelm and stress and ongoing trauma, that that can make it a bit difficult to actually really talk and process it because it's not past. It's, yeah. it's, it's still a whirlwind. It, yeah. Is that something that, yeah. is it easier to work with if it is past or can you work, you know, if you're swamped in overwhelm and living in direct provision, or is it then more the case, like you were saying about resourcing? Resourcing, and I think, yeah. yeah. I think if you're in active trauma, your the language center of your brain actually shuts down mm -hmm. in trauma anyway. It's really hard to find your words or even put words on your experience. Um, and the very nature of the stress is going to force that you function much much lower in your brain so back back down in in the brainstem or survival mode and I suppose when you're there your main preoccupation is going to be your own safety and looking after yourself so again you can't afford to be opening stuff up when you when you might need to go back out into an unsafe situation or or a certain dynamic in your community so yeah I would think that would probably make it impossible to engage with and I suppose when we would be looking at therapy readiness or or how to how to decide you know what's the right thing to do um very often you'd be looking at I suppose pre-therapy conditions and one of the biggest ones of those is actually safety so you know if you apply Maslow's peer pyramid like the basic needs have to be getting met they need the, the very basics the next level up is their safety and security because if you don't have that mm -hmm. remember like we were saying you can't explore you can't play mm -hmm. you're you're going to struggle to relate and struggle to build trust and that's going to make it harder to move up and the other critical I suppose point um around therapy readiness is the presence of a suitable, suitably equipped uh, supportive ally for the child or teen. So, you know, whilst a process is underway, the therapist contains that, you know, in the room, in the space for the child. But when the child is, you know, moving into their lived world, they need a container too, mm -hmm. you know, and the parent is that. So the parent needs to be as sensitive as they can be, as attuned as they can be, as aware as they can be, and as responsive, you know, so that's why groundwork 
with parents is really important because being in therapy can bring up a lot of stuff that, you know, sometimes things can look a lot worse before they look any better. And parents need to be supported, I suppose, to contain and hold that while it's happening. So, you know, if whole families or whole communities are stressed, you have to really look at that. Do you know, yeah. is is this the right thing at all? I mean, it depends on like in some models, maybe you know, certainly an under 16 year old would be would need a therapeutic ally in the model I was working in. Once they were over 16, it was assessed on a case by case basis. And if we felt they needed the adult, they would. Because remember, a chronologically um, aged 16 year old will will possibly not be that age developmentally or emotionally if they've yeah. experienced trauma. So um, so some lots of 16 year olds still had a person with them um and some were we felt could could try and do it um but i think safety and the presence of that therapeutic ally is critical especially when you're talking about young people mm. um and for some people that was a parent for some people that was a carer mm. for some people that was actually a grandparent and sure. um, for some if you know was a young person maybe living in residential um support it, it might have been a link worker who was willing to step up and do that um, and be the consistent mm-hmm. adult um and once once we felt somebody had that then we were we were happy to to give it a go you know once they were oh. safe and let them g- give it a go and try it out but the containment is important because you know, if we're if we're opening stuff and we're looking at stuff and we're trying to work through stuff, they need safe hands once they leave the space as well. You know, and hands and hearts and minds that understand trauma and the impact yeah. of it and what it can look like and what it can show up as, you know, in the real world, because it makes such an imprint and it has such an impact yeah. um, that it just needs such safety, I think, to to work with and through and, you know. And presumably, sometimes there there must be ethical um, difficulties there, particularly in the systemic kind of family context where some of the traumas have maybe happened within the family home, but they might be ongoing. So there might be ongoing domestic violence. So maybe like having the 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 perpetrator as part of therapy can be well that's that can't happen. Yeah, right. that can't happen because safety is a prerequisite for therapy. So if a child or young person was having any access with an alleged offender, whether anything is proven or not, therapy wouldn't be able to go ahead. Yeah. So yeah. what what might happen in that instance is you might support the other parent or direct them mm. towards supports, but there is that that actually couldn't and wouldn't, yeah. Could, Thanks. Wouldn't happen. Thank you yeah, for clarifying that. That was because... that was yeah, that was a big part of the policy for for the model that I was working in in that area, but also in private practice, um children couldn't for therapy um if they were having any access um or contact with anybody that was yeah unsafe in their world you know and I think sometimes people think oh let's just get therapy organized you know and let's do this but it's just maybe not always the first thing or the right thing that needs to happen other things need to to happen first does that make sense the oh it, yeah, yeah it does yeah, yeah, and, yeah and of course it doesn't mean that the let's say in the um domestic violence context that the perpetrator wouldn't benefit from their own therapy to they, understand yeah, themselves uh, very but often it, yeah, yeah they would and hopefully they do but yeah you couldn't you couldn't um expect a child to be able to do what they would need to do yes. around it because they'd have to keep shutting it down and going out and you know that would be actually That's, really yeah. hard to do um, and dangerous possibly yeah. as well you know that's it yeah, yeah yeah I think safety and containment are the biggest things to look at and the basics mm-hmm. you know like are there basic needs being met to a satisfactory level and, you know, with the amount of child poverty and homelessness and the housing crisis we have, you know, that's becoming quite significant as well. Do you know, mm-hmm. um, we've an awful lot of children in homelessness in this mm-hmm. country, which is just disturbing when you think about it. It is. You know? But is attachment actually relevant to the success of the therapeutic process? So, like again in terms of the dynamics between let's say you as a therapist 
um, either supporting parents now, is there an attachment dynamic there or when you were, you, you know, uh, working with uh, children and adolescents and their parents, like I, I know the phrase earned secure attachment, um, that type of thing. It can, can you give any reflections on, on the importance of attachment in the therapeutic setting? I think it's it's important for therapists to know and understand their own attachment style for sure. I think anybody that's working with children, you know, could could do with knowing a little bit about that. I I think just in terms of what can happen in a space in terms of transference, do you know what somebody will project onto you, you know, that's part of their experience or their story or their narrative you know that so you become like the the kind of hostile mother figure that's or it. rejecting that's mother it. Right. that's it and so people will act out or reenact or react we would think about react it means you're acting again so there can be stuff that comes at you and I suppose you have then a choice hopefully if there's time you know to notice it and process it and work with it but that can also hook on to maybe something in your attachment history which can result in counter transference which means you're reacting out of your stuff so that's why things like your own clinical supervision are really important in your work you know and your own therapeutic safe space where you're where you're starting to understand yourself but also it 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 plays a part in watching the interactions between the parent and the child as well. Do you know if 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 the style, you know, if the needs have been met in a reasonably consistent and attuned way, the attachment will be pretty secure. Mm -hmm. If they've been met in a more inconsistent or unpredictable way, you know, that's not going to be there. There might be some ambivalence or some anxiety. And I think sometimes understanding what might be happening can help you to understand the the interactions that are there and I suppose why people react in in the ways that they do um and you can work with that do you know mm -hmm. what I mean you can you can there's lots of playful and connecting things you can do to sort of bring people back together and I know that I was reading Dan Hughes' um, brain-based parenting recently. Okay. Have, it's really interesting from the point of view of blocked care okay. and how that can happen for parents. And like for for it to go well, do you know, the parents' approach system needs to be working well. Do you know to get the the right chemicals, I mm -hmm. suppose, firing. But to be able to make an approach as a person, you need to feel open and safe. Yeah. And if your child's behavior is really challenging or really aggressive or, you know, it feels hurtful or personal to you, which it isn't intended to be, that makes it harder to, to keep moving yes. in. You know, your reward system also needs to be working. It needs to be pleasurable. It needs to be satisfying. You know, your child reading system needs to be working well. You know, you need to be able to attune yeah. um, and empathize and figure out where they're coming from your own meaning making system as a parent, you know, understanding your own story and your own narrative um, mm -hmm. and how you're storying this whole thing is relevant. And then your executive system, do you know where you're having to be able to regulate your own impulses and, and stay in touch with your own state? So like, it's actually quite a complex mm -hmm. process and, you know, no more than kids stress responses and amygdalas yeah. kick off and they flip their lids. So do parents, you know, in particular Setting. So I think it's really helpful to to be able to explore that, to understand that and to just stand back from it and have a good look at it as well and try and get curious, I suppose, like his approach is paceful, you know, playful, accepting, curious and empathic. Um, but to be really trying to be curious about what might be going on there or, you know, sometimes parents can feel confused about they're in connection one minute and then there'd be very high levels of push you know, mm. ambivalence, you know, and that can be really confusing and destabilizing as well. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that's rooted in fear. So, mm. yeah, sometimes I, I find a lot of the work that I do now actually with parents is trying to help them to get in under their child or teen's behavior and try and understand their perspective and actually why things might be going down mm -hmm. the way they are. And I find that really helps parents because they go okay now that makes sense I get that and then they're hopefully able to respond a little bit differently 
that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. It, it, I think it it's just... really critical. I think, and I, I think we're all human, you know, when you're in a dynamic or an interaction with a human, another human, like lots of feelings, thoughts and things can get stirred up. So it's just important to know yourself and your own story and your own work and yeah. have your own place and space to, to, to look out for that. And I think, you know, teachers don't have that and they don't have supervision. Like it, kids will press buttons that you didn't even know you had, you know, exactly. and we are, we're all carrying little inner children in us, you know, mm -hmm. that have various different wounds and struggles and beliefs about ourselves and others and the world. And, you know, I think sometimes people don't always realize the dynamic impact of working, you know, with children and young people, and they don't always maybe get time or space to sit and process like, no. what, ha what happened for me there? Or what's that about? And I think it'd be lovely if they did, you know, yeah. I think it would be lovely if they did. And you it know. doesn't make people saints overnight either, you know, as we were no. saying, you can have all the information you can know about brain development, safety, attachment, and the importance of attunement and still be overwhelmed and stress and get it wrong. But mm -hmm. I think what does tend to happen more is if as an adult, you realize I did not behave as I would have liked to there. Yeah. I was hostile. I was yeah. uh, borderline abusive or un really unkind to a child yeah. who was who was overwhelmed. And I was I was pushed. My buttons were pushed. Mm. You might be more minded to make the necessary repair. Would you think yeah. that's and is oh, that it, important? It, it happened to me as a parent. I was yeah. driving along in the car with my son. He was probably 15 or 16 at the time. He was playing his music, Spotify, through the car radio. And on the way home, we needed to pull in and get something in the shop. And I just said to him, I'm just going in here because we need this. Um, will you turn that off? So when he turned off his phone, the radio came on, but much louder yeah. than his phone had been. And I, I've i never lost my startle response yeah. as a child. I'd be quite jumpy. So I, ju I actually jumped yeah. and he he laughed at me yeah. in innocently. Innoc now you can see where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> and so that tipped me into some sort of humiliation and shame. That was young. Yeah. And my God, I was horrible for the you disproportionate know, I response. Ate him. I <laughs> ate him. He wasn't going fast enough for me. I got super critical of him. He was looking at me like, what is wrong with you? And I got up and down two aisles of the shop at at high pace because I think I needed to move to regulate. Mm. And then I just had this thought going, how did you get here, Cathy? How mm. did you get here? And I have that question a lot, you know. So I, I took a breath and I said to him, I'm sorry, that's yeah. my stuff, you know. And he's a, he he kind of we talk a lot like we're very open mm. I said that was my stuff that I'm sorry and he was saying I'm sorry for laughing at you I said no it was probably very funny yeah. to you um because yeah. I actually like, yeah. jerked but I said you know what that's after tipping something and I reacted as a much younger person and I said and I'm sorry I said I got yeah. really critical of you and that wasn't okay but I suppose I've always had space yes. therapeutically and energetically to build my like reflective capacity mm -hmm. um as a person and as a therapist and as a parent and so I was able to get into repair but I was able to see pretty quickly that it was my reaction and yes. not his whereas if you didn't have that you could be going around for the day going being angry with somebody he's so upset. selfish yeah, yeah laughing at you laugh. and yeah laughing at you and embarrassing you and sure that that was a, like a a shame rabbit hole you know being laughed at and and when yeah. I thought about it I could trace it you know I could trace it but I reacted and that's the thing about things that are hard or even traumatic you kind of react as if it's still happening you yes. have to keep telling yourself you know this is not here now you know I am safe now or or whatever whatever it happens to be but I've had loads of those mm. experiences as a parent in particular mm. where I've had strong reactions and gone wow how did you get here like, Mm. You get here? now what I what I'm noticing is the time is shortening yeah. between the reaction and the how did you get here which is great but but like lots of people would be you know stuck in that reaction and big feeling and you know that's a good thing about having somebody mm. to bounce that off with you know that you can process it and figure it out but I think we ha we have 
parenting is really for me anyway it has been about learning to get to know myself and understand yeah. myself you know as much as you know learning to get to know my my child and his way of being but I've learned more about myself in the last 19 odd years than you know I think it's because it's through a relationship and through an interaction and through a dynamic yeah Thanks for sharing that, Kathy, because it is very human to, oh. to, to share these things, oh, you know, yeah. and we oh. can pretend we're amazing and perfect. But I mm. think um, that does does ourselves and our children and the people around us a disservice. Actually. Yeah, it does. So and it's connected yeah, from reality, yeah. actually. Yeah. And it makes it unsafe to do yeah. the lonely bits of parenting, you know, that you were talking about. It's like yeah. it's. Oh, geez, once a week I could, well, maybe not once a week, but it depends on if I'm looking after the basics. But, you know, it's, I think it's just about noticing it, minding yourself, getting curious about it, and then moving into repair as soon as you feel you can, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah. within schools, do you think teachers do that repair enough? Because I, again, I can imagine that after COVID, during COVID, with all the increasing overwhelm of children in general, you know, neurodivergence, dealing with that, dealing with children who might be traumatized or just, you know, uh, being annoying. Uh, like children can be demanding and annoying even mm. with nothing really. Yeah, they can be going on. on. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, and then they've stuff going on in their own lives, maybe their own family stress. Um, would it help again if 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 all teachers had this basic understanding about stress attachment safety the brain survival yeah. responses in order again to make necessary repair so that children don't grow up thinking all adults can just behave as they like and shout as they like and mm -hmm. and uh, you know but they're the ones who have to toe the line and comply and be good like mm -hmm. might might that set a different expectation of adults yeah, like I would hope and I would know teachers who are quite good at the repair and, you know, the being human in the work. Um, and I would hope that would continue to ripple out. But I think it's very, very valuable um, modeling to mm. be given to children, you know, that we're all human. You know, we all mess up. We all get things wrong. Um, and and we do move through cycles yes. of connection, ru rupture yeah. and repair. We're moving in and out of them all day. I suppose when adults don't repair, children can get very stuck and left with guilt, shame, mm -hmm. blame, you know, and thinking things that, that are their fault. And that isn't OK. So, mm -hmm. you no, know, I think that would be very valuable modeling to to implement. Um, and that takes courage and self-awareness and openness. But it could only be a good thing, I would think. I know mm -hmm. lots of teachers who who do work like that now and instinctively or because they know the importance of it um so the ones that i'm thinking about specifically would have either training that is therapeutic okay or restorative okay uh -huh. so uh, they're that they're because uh, there are very specific teachers coming mm -hmm. into my head at the moment so you know, I feel like if you're drawn to that work anyway, there's probably something, sure. you know, visceral or instinctual or whatever way you want to to put it. But, you know, I think a lot of those teachers I'm thinking of are quite proactive in their school community. And, yeah. you know, they're kind of, oh, I tried this and that kind of yeah. thing and just hoping that it will catch on. But I think the probably the hardest thing is that people feel like they need a toolbox or a tool belt. So they don't want to put one thing down. They'll say, yeah. well, what am I going to do instead? You know, they yeah. need an alternative. Um, and it doesn't need to be a doing two thing. This is a kind of a being with thing. So yeah. hopefully, like, I would be hopeful that that would be modeled yeah. over time and have a ripple effect. But, you know, children deserve yeah. a need fundamental respect from. yeah and it's fairness like if yeah. we're in the wrong it's only just, fair just that it. we try just and say it yeah, yeah put it yeah. right and and i think you know we can't hold them to the standard we hold them to it's not fair like it's not reasonable we all have off days we all have grumpy days we all have tired days you know we all have days where we're, we do things and say things we're maybe not too proud of you know i think it's just expectations need to be calibrated mm -hmm. and made like developmentally more appropriate and sensitive sometimes. Um, but I do think adults have huge potential in their own modeling, you know, and yeah. I think like even just taking children's perspective on things, just trying to imagine like, how would I 
experience that if I was six or seven or 11 years of age, you know, how would I need somebody to help me with that if I was that age, you know, rather than top down kind of commanding and demanding. So just thinking about them in terms of where they're at, yeah. but they deserve to be fundamentally respected. And that's not to be confused with permissiveness or, yeah. you know, it's it, that's a whole other thing you know um and i think people think it's an either or like yeah, if you sure. give them an inch they will take a mile they won't like i've worked with kids now for almost 26 years and i trust them implicitly mm -hmm. and i can say that from from years of work you know children are to be trusted children need to be trusted children know themselves they know what they need mm -hmm. uh we think we know better than them sometimes and that's the problem you know but mm -hmm. I think they they deserve just fundamental respect and repair and modeling and scaffolding and all of it mm -hmm. um just so that they can really I suppose reach their full potential yeah but I think again some of the reluctance might go back to people's own experiences if they've never had um their own wounds uh acknowledged or repaired like or or they have come to view an apology as a sign of weakness mm. you know and vulnerability rather than actually strength and reconnection you know mm. once uh so it, it to me it's all kind of part of the continuum of sort of it human is. behavior really yeah, it is. we can't presume that these things come naturally to people because of what they might have had mothers themselves yeah. and i think you know we're really good at making kids say sorry, you know, forcing apologies, just just say sorry, you know, and yeah. kid, kids on the yard used to, you know, <laughs> inflict all sorts of pain on each other and say to me, but I said sorry, as if like, that's my, that's my out here, you know, and they wouldn't look sorry and they wouldn't no. feel sorry, but they had learned this is what yeah. you do. So the best way for them to learn what a sorry, a true sorry, a repairing yeah. sorry should look like and feel like is actually to receive one yes. yourself, you know. Yeah. And if we want our kids to be empathic and able to take the perspective of other children, you know, the best way for them to get that learning is to be met really empathically and really sensitively, and then they can pass it on. So, you know, I think we've got to kind of walk the walk for a lot of this, but it's hard to do exactly if you didn't get that yourself. Really hard to do. Yeah. We're we're um, nearing the end now, Cathy, but if we could re return briefly to the subject of self-care um, for carers. So whether that is parents who are doing a tremendously important job, often under very difficult circumstances or lonely ones, but also for, for teachers who are a form of carers, even if they mm. don't view themselves primarily that way, yeah. or therapists, you know, who are definitely um, in, in caring professional social workers and the like. How important is self-care in your view and experience? I think it's critical. Um, and... It's something I've really had to look at for myself over the years. Um, and I think, you know, it has it has connotations now that are not necessarily helpful. Do you know they're they're quite um, you know, it's it's it become a bit of a buzzword. Yeah. And what does it even mean in in all truth, you know? And I suppose some, you know, short term temporary things might might give you a bit of a boost, but are you really minding yourself? I think. Yeah. Um. So if you look at the the circle of security or the attachment cup analogy, you know, if a child is constantly coming to you for refueling and refilling and top up in terms of whether that's through play, connection, listening, you know, supporting them with a big feeling, then the parent's reservoir or own cup is the levels are going down all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you have multiple children or, and obligations in life, or if, you've, if you're a teacher and you have lots of kids, you know, you've got to be making sure that you're replenishing your own it's full, reserve. Full yeah. Enough. yeah. And I think people willingly keep giving people top ups from their reserves, but they're not necessarily paying attention um, to what's left in it. So I think it's critical because there's an awful lot of parents now that I would see and talk to and, I would feel they're on the verge of burnout, if not mm -hmm. burnt out. And unfortunately, you know, with 
with parenting, it's not something you can clock in and out of. You know, the demands no. are there. They're incessant. They're just all the time. So it's critical to, to be able to mind yourself. And I think, you know, some people think it's selfish to mind yourself. It's not. It's it's absolutely vital. But I suppose for me, <laughs> I would have been coming back to Maslow again now. I would have been quite good at level two safety and security. I was quite bounded with relationships, friends, energy, setting those boundaries. I would have been quite good at looking after my love and belonging needs. Mm -hmm. Um, I would have been pretty good at it. Seemed you know I would study something. I would yeah. have a hobby. See my basic, my base of the pyramid that should be the widest. <laughs> Mine was the narrowest. So right. my, mine, when I Us looked at this, eating well, not getting no, enough sleep. My, that's mine. Looked like a Christmas tree with a really <laughs> skinny stalk because I I use that framework a lot myself yeah. and my parents. So I was like, I had the commute. I was eating a takeaway in the car at nine o'clock at night on the way home, and I had IBS at the time. That was yeah. not good. No. Wasn't drinking enough water. Was scrolling on the phone till all hours. You know, fueled by coffee. I don't actually, and I would have been quite good to attend to my emotional, my psychological, yeah. my therapeutic needs. Yeah. Would have gone for holistic therapy, cranio, like body work. Yeah. I was like, look at me, I'm doing it all. But when I got to the basics, I had to, I had to widen the base of my it's pyramid. Very interesting. Because that's how I, I don't, I don't know. I did burn out, I'd say. Yeah, I definitely did burn out at least once. Um, But, you know. I, I work now according to what my stress response can handle, you know, yeah. my own rhythm. I work I work now in a way that's very different to, to what I was doing before. But I think if I hadn't figured that bit out for myself around the basics. Now, some people are brilliant at the basics. I definitely was pushing, you know, way beyond um, what my Your body could do. Kind of yeah, thing, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, even things like protein and fuel like I'm vegan and gluten free I wasn't getting enough protein so I was loading carbs you know which are fine for quick release but mm. then you'd be starving again and yeah. <laughs> I just wasn't you know intentional about it um sleep water all of it um the only the only need I consistently met was the need for play and that was because of, of what I was doing you know that mm -hmm. would be really important to me but I think it's critical because if you're going to have to keep topping up other people's cups and your reserves are going right down, you know, it's like driving your car around when the the engine light is on or the, the fuel light is on. So there's only so far you can push that without there being a major consequence yeah. to it. So, you know, I think it's it's hard. And I think sometimes people get a little bit frustrated or, you know, dismissive of, oh, I haven't time to do that like or haven't this or that the time yeah I think so and you know it's some people will frame it as a day at the spa and whatever like if that's your thing great but that's mm -hmm. not that's that's quite an external solution to what's yeah. internal stress do you know what I mean and mm -hmm. I know for me it just was about going back to basics and really having a look at it like an audit almost yeah. like you know and, and have to and make changes around it yeah it's again, thank you for sharing that because really it it kind of um it's a lovely insight into balance, you know, that while you were minding yourself in various excellent ways, you were out of balance by oh, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah, by you know, not minding those fundamentals. And it's maybe okay to do that for a while, you know, mm. if you're under pressure and having a yep. very exciting time. Yeah. But to live and work like that for years, of course, is, yeah. is going to take a, a, yeah. a physiological toll, if not a mental one, That's I would it. imagine, you know. So thanks for sharing that. And it does, I mean, I can imagine as well when working with parents to bring, I, I don't know how much of yourself you'd share, but to be a bit a human bit. at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know? will absolutely share things like that, yeah. you know, if I see a, if I see, you know, a benefit and a rationale to sharing it. Yeah. And I'm very open with parents around, you know, stuff like noticing your own triggers and that, because yeah. I think, I just think parents relate more. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, And I just think it just brings home 
our our common humanity in it yeah. and the need for us to be compassionate with ourselves while we're figuring it out. You know, somebody said to me there lately, like you you leave the hospital with this baby and you just have this baby. You know, there's no manual and you know there could be no manual because everybody's so unique but you do feel very lost and not sure of yourself at times in it um yeah or there's the so many of... manuals that they're yeah that's the other side things, of it Jane you know it's, it's too overwhelming and everybody has an opinion about it and all that brings you further away from your own gut instincts and yeah. your own knowing as a parent you know and as the person who knows this child better than anybody yeah Thank you, Kathy. Just one final one. Uh, I like to ask a, a version of this question to everyone. What do you think that uh, policymakers and politicians could do to promote safety, equity and connection in childhood so that everyone has an opportunity to become a flourishing adult? Massive question. Oh, that's big. Yeah. <laughs> Anything that springs to mind. So for me, equity is not about giving everybody the same thing. It's about giving everybody what they need. Mm -hmm. And I think, I suppose for me, I wish policy was more intentional. And so I think there's lots of initiatives, you know, that are targeted and funded and, but there's no sort of long-term big picture thinking. Um. And I wonder how beneficial some initiatives are when basic needs aren't being met again. Maslow is coming back in here. So I would see just I would love to see just more commitment made to tackling childhood poverty and the housing crisis and homelessness um, in terms of connection. I'd love to see parents getting more support, you know, that at just various stages of their child's development, you know, I think it should be it should be something that would be great to have universally available as opposed to having to go and seek out yourself. And maybe even just um some real recognition recognition and celebration of the importance of play, you mm -hmm. know, in children's lives and learning and you know, stress regulation as well. Like play has 20 therapeutic powers and one of them is stress uh, inoculation so yeah. you know just that it would be utilized to its full capacity but I think yeah I think just getting the basics right and being more intentional about where the money is going I think there's lots of ad hoc things happening but they're not necessarily having the impact that that you'd want to see but at the very yeah at its very core I think the equity is more about making sure ki all kids have what they need and all adults that are helping them have what they need I yeah. think to understand them so I think I'd like to see it go in much lower on that hierarchy and lots more support for the adults who are supporting the children it's a big question it is um, but the housing thing I just it's so distressing to think of children sleeping in cars or hotels or you know just having no place to play or run around you know or or parents not being able to cook food it's just you know I think nothing is nothing is really possible unless those very basic needs are being met so um I think yeah and maybe flourishing. thinking about that yeah get about yeah. flourishing if you're living in a car with that's it yeah with no yeah. place to play and no that's food it. to cook that's it yeah yeah and there's an awful lot of money being put into well-being and mental health and all of those things and you know that's accessible to lots of kids depending on where they're at on their pyramid but you know we, I think we're going to have a real problem you know over time with the fallout probably of covid on development you know on children's um mental health and well-being on their parents mental health and well-being and this cost of living crisis we're in you know it's Grim. it's really it, it, yeah so i think i'd i'd rather see it go lower down so that yeah everybody has a chance so much. I don't think so, because I think if you're able to access that, you're probably doing reasonably OK anyway. So, you know, in order to give everybody the best chance, I think it should be targeted lower to to support the, the sort of movement up through, um, if that makes sense. But yeah, yeah, I, the, the housing thing is really just distressing.
It is. Yeah, it is, Cathy. Well, look, thank you so much for sharing so much of your time. I've thoroughly oh, no enjoyed our thank discussion. You. This has been Relationships Matter with me, Jane Mulcahy, and my wonderful guest today has been Cathy O'Byrne from the Swallows Trail Parenting Support. Thank you, Cathy. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you very much.